the time remaining, let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 17. And my scripture text is from verse 24 down to verse 41. I've entitled this, No Fear of God. If you were to sum up what it was that was the cause of Israel's condemnation, and tribes of the north, even as we've been studying, it would be this very point right here. They had no fear of God. Oh yes, they had a knowledge of God and it could define, explain what it meant for him to be holy and just. And yet it was simply a mere profession. There's no fear of God. And that's the state of all sinners born in this world left to themselves. There's no fear of God. Here in 2 Kings chapter 17, we're seeing now how the Lord carried Israel away out of their own land. We saw that in verse 23. It was the Lord that removed Israel out of his sight. It was as if that judgment fit exactly what was their idolatry and saying, you Enjoy that idolatry. You want to be like the other nations? Well, I'll carry you out of my sight into those nations and give you the desires of your heart, but send leanness to your soul. So I've often said, you don't want God giving you over to your own will. It's not free will, it's bound. And to serve that will, it will be to follow after the way of condemnation. Here, just as the Lord had put them in the land, now the Lord is removing them. As he said by all his servants, the prophets, every prophet beginning with Moses warned against their idolatry. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria under this day. Assyria was a part of what would be Iraq today up in the northern, northeast part of it. There was a king at the time by the name of Asher. So there were two separate kingdoms. That this was a ruthless king that ruled for a while, but then a couple hundred years, the Lord would raise up Babylon now and would defeat Assyria. And Babylon would come back down into Israel and take Judah out of the land because of their own idolatry. It says the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon, because at that time the king of Assyria ruled over Babylon, and from Kutha, and from Ava, and from Hamath, and from Sepharvaim. These were just major cities there that the Lord had caused to prosper for this one reason, this one purpose, to come against this place of Samaria that was the center of the idolatry. It says, place them in the cities of Samaria instead of children of Israel. So this was Assyria's way of overcoming their vassal nations rather than put the people that they had just vanquished in places of responsibility. They took their own people and monarchs and put them in these places to rule over the people. And so they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there, notice that they feared not the Lord. The Lord was using them. He was an instrument in his hand to bring condemnation and judgment. And yet they themselves feared not the Lord. These men that he had placed in these positions, you would think, well, they vanquished them, so now all's, all is well. No. Notice, therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. <laughs> if you wipe out entire cities as they did, the wild beasts then would begin to march through the land and seek prey because all the walls have been destroyed. And these Assyrian monarchs that they had placed in these different positions, the Lord sent lions among them, 
which slew some of them. This was a phenomenon. All of a sudden, all these lions appear. This reminds me of Egypt, when the Lord would bring these plagues against Pharaoh and his people. Again, to show that he is sovereign. This Assyrian army, which was ruthless, had just come in and vanquished. In fact, before Samaria fell, they besieged Samaria. That's how strong that city had been fortified against them for three years. It took that long for them to starve out the people, but it was in the Lord's time. So you'd think, they're the victors. They've got it. Now the Lord sends lions to begin to devour them. Lions sent from the Lord. There's nothing that takes place but what God has purposed. Notice this was among those that feared not the Lord. They had their gods. They worshiped their gods, but this is a God they did not know. And so God was getting their attention to let them know that it wasn't their gods that had given them the victory, but this Lord, even of the lions, so in verse 26, wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them because they know not the manner of the God of the land. It's interesting, isn't it? We've got to find out about this God. We've never seen anything like this where they at least acknowledged it was the God of the land that was sending these lions and disrupting their lives and their livelihood. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, this is where we see again people in religion and in their religious ways, they're going to seek to try to find a way to pacify God. Here it says, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence and let them go and dwell there. <laughs> so he's thinking, all right, since this is the, the God of Israel, let's go and get one of these priests that we carried out of the land and bring him back in and let them begin to teach the people how it is there to behave, how they're to walk, how they're to talk, so that this curse will be removed is basically what they were thinking, that somehow God would then show favor upon them if they could just figure out what makes this God happy and let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. What you're doing then is taking a corrupt priest that was taken out of the land because they were corrupt and bringing that corruption back in again that that same Priests begin to teach the people. Well, you know as well as I do, all that that can do is produce more corruption. But one of the priests whom they had carried away in verse 28 from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel. Remember, there were two places where they had placed these golden calves. One was in Bethel, in the southern part of the land, and the other was up in Dan. So here comes this priest back in the land, I'm sure the priest is probably thinking, okay, all is well. I can come back in here and I can teach people how to live. And notice here it says, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. And when you first read that, you think, well, that's a good thing. But if that priest is corrupt and he's teaching them how they should fear the Lord, do you suppose that they, he's gonna teach them a right? No. You can't take a false preacher and place him among people and that person is going to teach the people how to fear the Lord aright. Why? Because they're not going to be speaking of Christ. That's what the problem was here. They were void of Christ and his spirit. And the whole point of bringing him back was because they thought, well, we don't really know the rituals of the land. And so in bringing this priest back into the land, what's that priest going to teach? Nothing but the same rituals that in the end got them in trouble to begin with. You can't take a false preacher and by that preacher then teach the truth. 
board only uses those that he's taught by his spirit. And only those taught by the spirit can direct others as to how it is that God will be worshiped and how it is that they should fear the Lord. I'll tell you this straight up. There is no other way of satisfying a holy God other than through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly this one here was not teaching them of the Lord Jesus Christ, was not pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you stop and think about it, they already had in their midst prophets like Hosea, even in this, and Isaiah. The Lord protected them through this time. Where they were in all of this, uh, the Lord had them safely hidden away. Had any truly been concerned, they would have certainly said, well, there's Hosea, there's Isaiah, prophets of the Lord, let them speak. But no, they went and found a priest after their own desires and brought him in to the land. And so that's what we see here, that their message was mixed, their, their manner of preaching was mixed, all the while professing to point men to the Lord, yet they continued to serve their own gods. It says here in verse 29, how be it every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made. Every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. Do you realize this is really the beginning of the history of the Samaritans that goes all the way through to the time of Christ. And the Jews in Christ's day did not dwell well with the Samaritans because they considered the Samaritans to be a mixed breed. They were a remnant of the Jews of the day that had intermingled and intermarried now with the Assyrians. And that's really how the Samaritan nation began. It was in a mixed paganism, if you will. While on one hand, they held to the law. On the other hand, they worshiped God according to their, their desires. And these were planted by the Assyrians. And from that time forward, they persisted in their pagan ways. It was a mixed message. I believe it represents what we have today in so-called Christendom, where the name of Christ is mentioned and people speak of the God of the Bible, yet they know not the God of the Bible. Again, because there's no fear of God. God has never been revealed in them by his spirit. But I find this, again, to be a sign of God's mercy because while he destroyed the 10 tribes of Israel and scattered them so that they never again were brought into land, yet he preserves this mixed breed of Jews and Assyrians that together formed this new nation of Samaria. And you say, well, why would God do that? Well, I believe that the Lord had his elect among those Samaritans. Stop and think in John chapter 4, for example. Who was it that when the Lord said, I must needs go through Samaria? It was to meet a Samaritan woman there at the well. And the Lord was pleased to draw her unto himself. So there's a reason why God does what he does. He did not completely destroy things, preserve them even down through the years. Even though they were enemies of God and of the children of Israel, but he had his elect, he had his remnant among them. And when the men of Babylon made Succoth Benoth, and the men of Cuth made Nergo, and the men of Hamoth made Ashima, and the Abites made Nibahaz and Tartak and the Sepharbites burnt their children in fire to Adrammelech and Anamelech, the gods of Sepharbaim. 
this shows again that even with God's judgments, that's not what brings people to be turned to God in truth. Nothing but the spirit of Christ working in the center, drawing them out of their idolatry can cause sinners to know him in truth. Otherwise, all they'll do is wherever they go, they'll continue to worship falsely, build their places of worship falsely, just like their forefathers had done. Now it said here in verse 32, so they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places. They, did, they went out just literally priest hiring. It's like you do today, pulpit committees. We, we've got to find somebody to lead us. It doesn't matter who. And they went out and found the lowest of the people in order to serve as priests for the high places. It's a play on words. You ask yourself here at verse 32, well, how is it that it says they feared the Lord and then made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places? High places were were places of worship, just like you have people today, when they build up their their places of worship, they like it to be seen. They, they like it to be up in places of the city where everybody can see it. Because they seek the glory of men. So it says they feared the Lord, and then in verse 33, they feared the Lord and served their own gods. Well, that tells you something right there. What is the true fear of the Lord? There are some that fear because they fear his judgments. And so they continue to seek ways to pacify the Lord, all the while serving their own gods. Only the Lord knows how many today worship in places of worship out of fear of the Lord, but it's a fear of judgment. It's not the true fear of the Lord whereby these are reverencing the Lord for who he is and his glory and honor. They fear for their own lives. They fear for their own self-interest. And yet the true fear of God is not in them. And the proof is they don't want to hear of the true God. Whenever this message is declared and you declare God and his sovereignty, people run from that. Now that's not the one I fear. And so they make gods of their own imagination. They continue to, to do so. They're wrong idolaters by nature unless God's pleased to give us a heart to know him in truth. And so they feared the Lord. If you were to go out and take a poll and ask people how many of you fear the Lord, they'd raise their hand. Oh yeah. They know there's a judgment to come. And yet in their blindness and hardness of heart, they do not hear his word. They will not hear it. And so they set about to establish gods of their own imagination. And where do they learn about this? In verse 33, it says, after the manner of the nations, whom they carried away from thence. We've got organizations and congregations today that you just sit and scratch your head and wonder, how is it that they implement what they do? Well, they go to these conferences. They learn from each other. Have you tried this? Experiences, popularity, all of this is what they follow. Because apart from the Spirit of God, they cannot come to Christ and won't. Verse 34 says, unto this day, they do after the former matters. It doesn't matter how long you give sinners to repent, if you will, or to turn to the true and living God, they never will. This is where God in his justice acts on men because he's been forbearing, he continues to be forbearing, and yet, left to themselves, where do they turn? They continue the same old manner. Same old fig trees, all the way back to Adam. Fig leaves is what they clothe themselves in. They continue to practice all of those former rituals. In fact, the area of the northern kingdom of Israel was not reoccupied by Judah, before even Judah was subjected to the Babylonian Empire for the same reason. This mixed profession, this mixed religion that was first promoted by the Assyrians continued for many centuries in Samaria and existed all the way into the New Testament times. 
And yet God still had his elect among them that he had purposed to save. So it's not a contradiction. If you if you read prayerfully what it's saying, because to some they get confused. Well, did they fear the Lord or didn't they? Well, they feared the Lord for the wrong reason. They feared the Lord according to their own imagination. And there again is proof that man left to himself will not know the Lord that is to be feared. But down here in verse 34, again, unto this day they do after the former manners, and they fear not the Lord. In the true way, God is spirit. He's to be worshiped in spirit and truth. That's what he told the Samaritan woman. The day would come when it wouldn't be either on Mount Gerizim, read that in John 4, or in Jerusalem, but that the Lord would be worshiped in spirit and in truth. Who's that? That's in Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of everything that Jerusalem represented at that time, the temple, the priesthood left in man's hands, they only corrupted it further. But when Christ came and fulfilled all those types and pictures, in him is the true worship. They fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. Now it goes all the way back to Jacob. What made the difference between Jacob and Esau? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, is what the Lord said. And his name was named Israel, prince with God. That's a representation of who that seed was that should come from his loins. Many thousands of years later, that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. But with whom the Lord had made a covenant and charged them, saying, Ye shall not fear other gods, nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and a stretched out arm, him shall ye fear and him shall ye worship and him shall ye do sacrifice. Where we see him, that's Christ. Only in by through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the statutes and the ordinances and the law and the commandment which he wrote for you, ye shall observe to do forevermore, and ye shall not fear other gods. There's no mixture when it comes to worship. It's either in the way that God has declared here in his covenant with his people through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, or it's worshiping false gods. There's a lot of false worship today being done under the name of Christ, Christendom. There is a Jesus being preached, but Paul said he's another Jesus. There is a spirit. I've heard people talk about what is just it's just hard to believe that the spirit's not there. Well, the spirit is there, but it's not the spirit of Christ. It's a spirit of emotion and of self-servant. The covenant that I have made with you, ye shall not forget, neither shall ye fear other gods. You think, who is he talking to here? Well, that's that remnant. That even though these others have gone their way and God's given them over to their own reprobate minds, yet there is that remnant as Paul said in Romans 11 and verse 5, a remnant according to the election of grace. Had it not been for God choosing out, even from among the worst of the worst here in their false religion, choosing out those that he would say there would be none saved. We would all have been as Sodom and Gomorrah, is the way Isaiah puts it. When you're reading this as one that is an object of God's love and grace, even in the midst of all of this paganism and heathenism being done even in the name of Christ. Just know that that's because God has made you to be an object of his mercy. And so the word is in verse 39, that the Lord your God ye shall fear. That's who fears the Lord in spirit and truth. It's the ones that have been taught by his spirit and been shown their lost estate like Isaiah, that when his eyes were open, he cried out, woe is me, I'm undone. There's no hope in this flesh, no hope in our works or our will. But the Lord your God, ye shall fear. It's God himself that puts that true fear in the heart of sinners, and he shall deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. Think about all our enemies. We're talking about spiritual now. This very flesh is an enemy. 
Like Paul said, the things I would do, I do not. The things I would not do, that I do. He's talking as a converted sinner. But in the end, what was his hope? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Well, it says here, you notice the difference. But the Lord, your God, that's those that have God as their God, not just in creation and providence, but salvation, as opposed to verse 40, how be it they, all others, did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord. They feared in the sense of fear that he would come and take them out, fear of judgment. Many reasons why people profess the Lord today or cry out to him out of fear. They don't want to go to hell. They look for a preacher to give them some kind of assurance. So there's this fear, but that's not fear of the Lord and salvation. The true fear of the Lord is acknowledging that should he cast me into hell, he would be just in doing so. It's the reverence for the Lord in all his ways, without argument. Otherwise, it wouldn't be said here, these nations feared the Lord. He demonstrated his power and sovereignty over them, and yet left themselves what they do. They served their graven images, and what did they do? They taught their children to do the same, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so did they unto us this day. I fear for children being raised today in so-called Christendom. They're being taught in the manner of their fathers. And it, it just grieves me to hear these so-called child evangelists. And they get their parents bringing these children to these little day clubs and other things. And one goal by their own admission is to get them early. You take a little child three or four years old and you ask them, do you want to accept Jesus as your savior? And if you don't, they'll have to send you to hell. What child is going to say, I want to accept you? teach them early to have a fear, but it's not the fear of God. It's not knowing God in truth. Better to teach the child as the word declares without man's persuasion or manipulation to try to get them into some profession. But I'll tell you, children are being raised this way as their former manner. And they're just fodder for condemnation because it's not the true fear of the Lord. The only one that truly can teach a sinner the fear of the Lord is the Lord himself, where in his time they're brought to see their own condemnation and the cry out of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot there, very somber. I pray the Lord would be our teacher. If he has so taught us the fear of the Lord, we thank him.